Yes, I'm Dan Weiss. I'm the principal investigator of the Resolve Stellar Populations JWST Early Release Science Program. I'm at UC Berkeley, and none of this would be possible without uh, this wonderful team of about 40 members. Um, the primary scientists are listed here, and there's about 30 other team members um, that are doing fantastic work. So what you see in the background, I'm just going to clear away this text, our HST images of nearby galaxies where we're resolving individual stars, and HST has been absolutely transformative for this type of work where we're able to effectively dissect and resolve galaxies on a star-by-star -star basis. Um, and the reason HST has been so successful is due to its sensitivity and its high angular resolution. So this is what's being demonstrated here. So this is an image of M31. And so that's what's being shown in the upper inset. Um, and this is a ground-based image in the top panel. And a zoom in inside that inset, so the cyan box, is a little OB association in the star-forming disk of M31. And the top panel is what you'd see from the ground. And the bottom panel is an HST image of the exact same region. And so the idea is that what appears kind of blurry and blended from the ground is resolved into individual stars in the crowded disk of M31. And this has really been a forte of HST. And the goal of this ERS program is to provide the tools that will enable JWST to build on this legacy of HST and go even further. So uh, the strength of being able to resolve individual stars and other galaxies is through building color magnitude diagrams. And so this is an example of a simulated color magnitude diagram, so an, an HST ACS observation and two of the commonly used filters, F606W and F814W. And here I've just chosen to color code this simulation so each point is a star and they're color coded by their age. And so you can see effectively we can measure the age distribution or the star formation history of a galaxy basically by looking and modeling its or magnitude diagram. Just to orient you, um, many of these uh, features you see in the color magnitude diagram are well-known uh, stellar evolutionary sequences. You probably remember from studying HR diagrams, so things like the main sequence, uh, core blue and red helium burning stars, which are post-main sequence stars um, above about two solar masses, the red giant branch, uh, the horizontal branch, the ancient main sequence turnoff, which is a great indicator of star formation in the very early universe. And even if you go fainter, um, there are pre-main sequence stars. And so this is typically what one might see with, with HST. And now what I'm showing on the right is an example with JWST near CAM. And so uh, while 606 and 814 have been the workhorse for HST, we anticipate that um, F90 and F150 are going to be a similar workhorse um, for much of the science with JWST. And so you can see many of the same features in the JWST color magnitude diagram. Um, but what you'll notice is there are some subtle differences. For example, the things that are luminous in blue in, with an HST become dimmer in the infrared. Um, but things that are red in, in optical colors tend to become brighter and more accessible um, to JWST. And so things like the red giant branch and the ancient main sequence turnoff become uh, really prominent with JWST. So um, what JWST is going to do in this, in this science area is enable resolve star science studies at larger distances to lower luminosities in regions of higher extinction and areas of higher crowding than any other facility, including HST, have been able to do. And so the goal of our program is to provide the tools that enable the community to pursue science in these areas. So one way to look at this is to look at science as a function of distance from the Milky Way. So what we're seeing here is JWST observing from objects from close to far left to right. Uh, all the way from the Milky Way to tens of megaparsecs. And what I'm going to do is just walk through various types of science that JWST is going to enable at each of these distances. And this is, you know, far too, there's far too much science to describe uh, in its entirety, but I'm just going to go through the highlights. So um, JWST will showcase all of this. Our ERS program is designed to basically highlight everything um, that you see here. So 
Starting uh, in the Milky Way, what you're seeing in the lower left-hand part of the screen um, is an HST with C3 IR color magnitude diagram of 47 tux. So this is a, a globular cluster. And um, so typically, globular clusters with HST in the optical are observed just below the main sequence turnoff. Uh, the faint stars are very red and, and can be very expensive to observe. But when you switch to the IR, you can go much, much fainter and much deeper. And what you see is this additional structure called the main sequence kink. And this, um, this kind of inflection in the color magnitude diagram at this point is due to a change in opacity in the atmospheres um, of, of low mass stars. And it's an indicator. It's very metallicity sensitive. And so uh, between the age information provided by the main sequence turnoff and the metallicity information provided by this kink, we can start to measure the ages of ancient globular clusters to sub gigi or age precision. It's going to be really um, incredible. And this is something that JWST is going to enable for all globular clusters in the Milky Way without a substantial investment in time. So it's just going to be incredible for globular cluster science. Stepping a little bit further away, one thing that JWST is going to enable is a measurement of the subsolar uh, stellar IMF in galaxies outside the Milky Way by directly counting stars. So some of you may be aware that there is um, suggestions that the IMF varies, the low mass IMF varies as a function of environment. Uh, and this has been found, this has been shown to be the case in several ultra faint dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. And, um, so this has been done with HST. And if you look at the color magnitude diagram being plotted, HST typically goes down to depths of about 0.4 solar masses, which is actually not quite faint enough or low enough mass to get great constraints on the full shape of the IMF. However, in, in, in a very, in a few hours, JWST is going to go down to about 0.1 or 0.15 solar masses, which gets us really down to the, um, near the lower limit of, of stellar mass. And so we're going to be able to fully characterize the shape of the IMF for dozens of galaxies that orbit the Milky Way. Um, and so it's just going to be a, an incredible way to investigate star formation of the IMF in these extremely low metallicity environments. Stepping a little bit further away, one of the things that JWST is going to be able to do is measure proper motions of stars and of galaxies. Uh, so what this means, for example, um, what's being plotted here, is the proper motion in right ascension and declination of 47 tuck, the globular cluster, and the SMC, which is in the background. So the SMC forms this clump of stars that effectively have no measurable proper motion because the stars are too far away for this particular baseline. But what you see is the secondary clump, which is 47 tuck. And so this has basically separated out this entire globular cluster and proper motion space from the background, uh, which is just incredible. And of course, Gaia has um, really made this area uh, a forefront, but it's limited to relatively nearby distances where HST has pushed it even further. And JWST, by virtue of being even more sensitive, is going to allow us to make these types of measurements out to distances of megaparsecs. So we're going to be able to, for example, measure the bulk motions of galaxies one to two megaparsecs away. They're transverse motions in addition to radial motions of distances give us full phase space information. So what you can do with this is pretty incredible. So um, what I'm showing in, in the right here is an example of Gaia proper motions combined with line of sight spectral velocities and a distance to the Milky Way satellite galaxy sculptor. And this is a model of the orbits by Ekta Patel's recent paper, just showing how close sculptor has gotten and how its orbits change as a function of time uh, based on various assumptions about the mass of the Milky Way, uh, whether you include the LMC and SMC. And the orbits are really tightly constrained because Gaia has excellent proper motions. But of course, Gaia can only do this out to a few hundred kiloparsecs um, from most galaxies, where JWST is going to enable this to the edge of and beyond the local group. So we can start to look at full orbital histories of essentially the accretion of the local group. It's going to be really incredible. Pushing even a little bit further, uh, one of the things that HST has done remarkably well is quantify the star formation histories of galaxies. Uh, for example, low mass galaxies have incredibly diverse star formation histories. So what's being plotted 
in the lower left is the cumulative star formation history of virtually every known isolated dwarf galaxy where the imaging reaches the ancient main sequence turnoff. And so these are galaxies that we don't believe have had mostly major interactions with massive hosts. And so what you can take away from this plot is that when left to their own devices in isolation, these galaxies do all sorts of things. Their star formation history can rise at early times and end abruptly, or they can continue forming stars for all of cosmic time. And really, when you get into this low mass galaxy regime, it's the result of this stochastic process. Uh, unfortunately, HST is just not that sensitive in the red, so reaching the ancient main sequence turnoff can be challenging. This is where JWST comes in with its infrared sensitivity. We're going to, for the first time, be able to reach the ancient main sequence turnoff of galaxies outside the local group. Uh, so now we will remove the effect of you know, potential biases in our understanding of galaxy formation from local group studies by pushing into the field. And for low mass galaxy studies, it has the potential to increase the sample size from roughly 10 to something like 30 to 50, where we can measure these really detailed star formation. Another area that JWST is going to be really strong is in mapping dust and the ISM. This is not something that was um, immediately obvious to us, but what really um, enlightened us in this area was the FAT survey of M31. And so this is an example from Julian Del Canton's paper about how we were able to create dust maps at 20, mega, or 20 parsec resolution at the distance of M31. So the left panel shows uh, an infrared, so HST infrared CMD. And what you see is a really tight sequence of red giant branch stars. And then if you compare it to the right-hand panel, you can see almost this bifurcation of this sequence. And what's going on is we're picking up both an unreddened population of red giant branch stars in front of the disk of M31 and a reddened population behind the disk of M31. And the difference in color or the difference in temperature of these populations allows us to infer how much dust there is along the line of sight. And because galaxies like M31 are so well populated in stars, we can do this at really fine spatial resolution. And so in the 20 parsec regions, you're able to actually measure AB uh, very, very accurately. Uh, and so what's shown in the right is the full dust map of M31 from the FAT survey. And you can see all these intricate features. And this is done by the technique of just modeling this bifurcation of the red giant brain. And so we can get this, this essentially stellar probe of, of the dust. And JWST, with its strength in the infrared, is going to be able to do this at to larger distances because of its angular resolution, excellent sensitivity. So making dust maps like this for many galaxies is going to be a strength of JWST and local um, volume systems. Another thing that I will just mention but not really belabor is that the distances, so population to distance indicators, such as a horizontal branch, and RLR have generally been too faint or too crowded, even for HST to do at appreciable distances, but they will totally be within the realm of JWST. Moving a little bit further away, one of the things that JWST was really strong on is evolved red stars. So uh, I'll focus on asymptotic giant branch stars, but things like red supergiants are also going to be a forte of JWST. So what's being shown here in the left is a plot of the initial mass of an AGB star versus its metallicity. And the shaded regions indicate where we have calibrations, the Milky Way, large Magellanic cloud, small Magellanic cloud, and some globular clusters. But what you see are there are very large regions where we don't have great observations of the mass metallicity relation for AGB stars. And so, for example, high mass, low metallicity AGB stars we just, they're very rare, and so one needs to survey more environments uh, and go to redder bands because there may be dust around them. Similarly, we don't have great calibrations across at very high and super solar metallicities, and so this is something that JWST will help enable in M31 and other environments. In the middle panel is an example of how we'll be able to separate out different types of AGB stars, so M type, which are oxygen rich, and C, which are carbon rich. Um, are very informative for the physics of AGB stars, which are highly unstable and going through a lot of uh, rapid evolution, such as dredge-ups changing their surface chemistry. 
And so it turns out that JWST broad plus uh, medium bands are very good for separating out these classes of populations and providing excellent calibration samples for AGB stars, something that just hasn't been possible uh, until now. And the last thing to note is that these luminous red stars, AGB, red helium burning, and red supergiant stars, dominate the near IR SEDs of star forming galaxies basically at all cosmic times. So as we shift into rest frame IR at higher redshifts, understanding these populations becomes increasingly important. And finally, I'll also note the tip of the red giant branch distances, which have been the most popular and productive um, population two distance indicator are gonna be a real strength of JWST as well because the tip of the red giant branch becomes brighter in the near infrared. So um, with all the science in mind, we designed the ERS program and we selected targets that would efficiently sample all of that science. So uh, our program is a 27 hour program that's gonna image with near cam and nearest in parallel, a Milky Way globular cluster, which is nominally M92 an ultra-faint dwarf galaxy, which is nominally Draco 2, and an isolated star-forming dwarf galaxy, which is nominally WLM. And each of these were selected to enable technical development, as well as all the science that I described um, to you before. So um, this is a slide that just, it's very busy, so I will just slowly walk you through it, that just shows the details of the targets. So the three images show M92, Draco 2 and WLM left to right. What you're seeing in blue in each of the images are the proposed near cam and nearest pointings. Uh, so for example, in M92, they were designed to overlap the rich set of HST archival data. Uh, similarly, in Draco 2, uh, there's HST data. So we have placed the near cam field to match that and put a nearest field in parallel. There's also Keck spectroscopy. These are very sparsely populated systems so they may only have hundreds of member stars um, that are accessible uh, both with HST and spectroscopy. And so maximizing the overlap between our imaging and spectroscopy was a goal here. And Draco 2 is an excellent representative of all the ultra-faint galaxies uh, around the Milky Way. So it'll really show us what we can do uh, with JWST. And finally, WLM was selected because it's a representative star-forming galaxy at the very edge of the local group, about a megaparsec away. So it's gonna be a very crowded environment. It requires about 20 hours of HST time to reach the ancient main sequence turnoff, and we'll be able to do that in a bit less with JWST. Uh, here, we're gonna be able to compare the HST and JWST results, as well as create catalogs across, um, across all the bands. An additional bonus about WLM is that it has all the CO clouds detected, which is it's so making WLM one of the lowest metallicity galaxies to have CO detection. So it's going to be allow us to study the metallicity, metallicity and distribution of the, the ISM in, in WLM. The table below these figures summarizes the observing strategy. So it gives the, the filters which were selected to enable a range of science that are listed in the bottom, call, the bottom row of the table. Uh, in nearest, we're going to be running primarily in F90 and F150 in parallel um, because we believe these are the best workhorse filters. And the exposure times are listed there. There's about 20-ish hours of science time for a total, and a total program time of 27 hours, so it is a very efficient observing program. In terms of deliverables, um, the primary deliverable is the construction and dissemination of crowded field PSF fitting software. So the idea is to extract all of the color magnitude diagrams I showed you. You effectively have to go into these crowded images and simultaneously model the PSF of all the stars at the same time. And this is a very computationally taxing and even mathematically difficult problem. Um, members of the team, and I will show you who those are in a moment, have been working on this for, with HST for quite some time and are also leading efforts with W for us to do this. And so we will be the ones delivering the same software and data products um, for JWST. The second goal is to calibrate the JWST ETC for PSF photometry. Uh, it is kind of a hidden secret that the uh, HST uh, ETC historically had not been great for PSF photometry, um, but it took some empirical calibration to improve its accuracy. And we would like to do the same thing with JWST as early in its lifetime as possible. 
We'll generate HST and JWST matched source catalogs. So we'll be doing simultaneous photometry of JWST and HST at the same time. And for all of these things, we'll be providing easy to follow examples like Jupyter notebooks that demonstrate the data reduction techniques, uh, how to run PSF photometry, some science application demonstrations, and of course, uh, help with observational planning uh, for those that are interested in these science areas. Uh, and I'll end with this slide, which just shows the team. So I'm overseeing the program. Um, the technical development is led by a combination of these people, Jay Anderson, Andrew Cole, Andy Dolphin, Dustin Lang, and Ben Williams. And they have been the primary drivers behind much of the development for HST, uh, W first, and um, really put all of this to the test in the FAT survey. Within the team, there are six science programs, each with their own lead. So while I'll be overseeing a lot of the technical development, the science team is being divided up uh, to experts in those areas. So our science areas are star formation histories, evolved stars, globular clusters, the low mass stellar IMF, proper motions, and extinction mapping. And so um, they will be developing the science cases and providing demonstrations of how our observations will enable that type of science. So with that, uh, I'll end there and take questions, and I've also left my contact information in case people have questions at later times. All right, thank you very much, very informative. And here we thought HST did it all, and now you're showing that JST is gonna do wonders, that's great. Um, Anyone online have a question about stellar populations with James Webb? You can just unmute yourself. Well, as usual, I do have a question. Um, so on filter selection, um, I mean, I, I, you talked a lot about the nine the 0.9 and the, and the 1.5, but the other filters, I, could, I saw there was a little variety, and can you just talk a little bit to how you chose those? Yeah, so um, going back to the table, for, I'll just briefly walk you through them. So some things like the F277, F444 filters, um, we believe may help us uh, find dust around RGB stars in globular clusters. Um, it's been hypothesized that there may be dust creation at low metallicities on the red giant branch. Um, so there are some theoretical models that suggest by going to slightly redder wavelengths to mid infrared, it may be detectable. So mm -hmm. we're going to experiment with that. Um, for Draco 2, one of the things we'd like to find, this is a very primordial galaxy, and there may be extremely metal poor stars there, and there's been some work with WISE and other um, surveys to indicate that the mid-infrared medium bands may be good at selecting metal poor stars um, and for spectroscopic follow-up, and so we're going to try that in Draco 2. And in WLM, the motivation was evolved stars, so going back to Martha Boyer's work on AGB stars, the F250M and F430M filters we believe are going to be very good for separating, chemically separating out um, AGB populations. Ah, very interesting. Well, that, that was very informative because unlike, for example, Spitzer um, and maybe even Hubble, there's such a variety of filters on James Webb that's a little disorienting about how to choose. So thanks for that, uh, that explanation. Of course. Um, other questions of people online? One question. Yes. Um, so um, if you go down to really, really faint magnitude mm -hmm. like with one solar mass. Um, do you suffer from the star galaxy separations or the foreground background sources? And if so, what is the plan to deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that HST has been very good for is star galaxy separation at faint magnitudes in the optical. Uh, in the infrared, even HST, because of its larger PSF, still has star galaxy separation challenges when you get um, down to around half a solar mass or something like this for many galaxies. Um, our observations of Draco 2 are going to allow us to test for star galaxy separation as best as possible. It's a fairly nearby system. Um, we'll be able to get spectra of some potential galaxies and see how the star galaxy separation just from photometric selection works. Um, 
It's a little hard to predict ahead of time, um, but it's something we hope to explore early in our ERS program. Well, thank you very much, Dan.